Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of ADHD Love Parent Talk. I am Yakini. Today, my guests are Katia and Yael, and we are going to be discussing misconceptions when it comes to those who have ADHD. I really like this topic and I'm excited about this topic because there are so many misconceptions and falsehoods around some thinkings around ADHD. So I'm really excited about digging into that, sharing some, and then you know, how can parents get more facts when it comes to ADHD? Okay, so welcome, welcome you guys. Thank you for having us. Yes, uh, thank you. Absolutely, I'm so excited to, for you to be here. So please tell the audience a little bit about yourself, whoever first. Go ahead, yeah. Oh, of course. Hi, I'm Yael Rothman. Um, Kachi and I are both uh, pediatric neuropsychologists who practice out of uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, outside of the uh, DC area. Um, my background is I went to graduate school for clinical psychology and then uh, went to uh, Denver and did an internship there and did a postdoc fellowship at the Children's National Hospital in DC and uh, started to work there and then moved on to private practice. And my, our focus as neuropsychologists is the brain behavior relationships. Mm -hmm. So although we're trained as clinical psychologists, we focus on the assessment piece. So okay. we understand um, different developmental um, uh, conditions. We see kids with medical conditions and um, create, uh, assess and then create treatment plans uh, to okay to help them. But Katya can talk a little bit more about that too. Awesome. Um, sure. I went to grad school at UMass Boston, got my PhD in clinical psychology and did my postdoc up there. I worked in private practice, well, at a group practice there for a couple of years and then moved down here. I've been at our current practice. I was doing the math before this for almost 12 years, which feels nice. crazy. Wow. It feels really crazy. I guess I'm a lifer. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we, yeah. So just as Yale was saying, we our clinical psychologists, we have the neuropsych specialty and we assess, diagnose, recommend, sort of try to put people on a path that will help them and their kids. Okay. Very cool. And before we jump in the topic, um, you know, one of the, how do I say it? Some people say you are tested and other people say you are assessed when it comes to ADHD. What is the difference and what is really happening? <laughs> Well, that's interesting. Do you want to take that or shall I? I guess I interchange these words. So okay. kind of semantic. I'd say it's a question of semantics. Okay. I'd say um, I prefer to say assess because test sounds sort of, I mean, people have their own feelings about, you know, standardized tests and it's sort of stress, stressful, anxiety provoking. So I prefer to say an assessment, although it really means the same thing. And, but with kids, I typically say we're going to do some activities to see how you learn best. Because again, you don't want to doesn't, you don't want it to sound scary or hard or just okay. off. -putting. All right. Very cool. And do either one of you have ADHD? No, we have it in my family, but not me personally. Okay. Same answer. Okay. <laughs> just it's curious. A, it's, it's, <laughs> always, it's, it's a question generation. that always comes up. <laughs> it's a generation for us, my mother and my daughter both, but not me. So. Oh, that's too funny. Leapfrogged over me. <laughs> right. All right. So let's dig into the topic. So um, again, we hear a lot about misconceptions. So can you share some of the top conceptions that you guys have heard when it comes to ADHD? Yeah, definitely. I, I think one of the biggest things that happens when someone comes into my office to have their child assessed is, um, oh, they probably don't have ADHD because they spend hours playing video games, mm -hmm. right? And they can uh, focus and do that. I would say I hear this so often. And that is one of the superpowers of ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. Is this hyper-focus ability on preferred activities. And this is, this is more the rule than the exception. This is what we hear about almost with every single individual who has um, this diagnosis is that they're able to hyper-focus and spend a lot of time in the preferred activities and then really lack the focus in the non-preferred activities. So um, that is by far probably the most common one that I hear. Katya, yeah. would you agree? No, me too. And I would say, I was just talking to parents about this this morning in a feedback session. Um, I often will say, you know, it's called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but that deficit word is yeah. really confusing because we're not talking about inability to attend. It's more that the kids 
can attend as well on the things that we want them to attend to, like their schoolwork, their reading, et cetera, et cetera. But if it's something they enjoy, they feel confident with, um, then it's a whole different story, right? Mm. I like to to explain, I'm so sorry. No, no, go ahead. But I love to say, yes, it's called attention deficit, but we're thinking of attention variability Mm. is really kind of uh, what we're looking at, the the preferred versus the non-preferred. Okay. And that makes sense. And, you know, and I see that with my children. I mean, you talk about the preferred activities. My daughter loves to read. She can Mm -hmm. sit and read for hours. My son would run the other way. (laughs) Every time he has to read for 30 minutes. I mean, we literally have a 20 minute conversation about why he doesn't want to read, but he's that video game player. Like he loves playing video games and could for all of his life, if that was feasible. Right. And right. so, um, just an example like that, cause I know we're going to go through misconceptions, but how do you work with children for that type of misconceptions? How do you get them to do what they have to do, even though they don't really want to? I mean, I'll jump in with some thoughts and, uh, I tend to think that it's a question of balance. I mean, as with everything in for all of us with everything in life right like we want to um oftentimes kids with adhd the school day can be quite hard uh at times right it's tiring it's hard work and then they come home and we do want them to have that opportunity to have their downtime and just do what makes them feel good and competent right um but it tends i think it's good to have a good sort of a schedule around that so you know Mm -hmm. when you come home Let's have, this is what I do with my girls. When you come home, we can play games on the iPad for, you know, 20, 30 minutes, whatever, while you have your snack. And then I'm going to give you some time warnings and then we're going to transition off that and we're going to move into something else. So it's part of the routine, but it doesn't take over the routine, so to speak. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So there's designated times to, yeah. to have that uh, opportunity to do the pleasurable and preferred activities, which I think is so important too. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Okay. So any other misconceptions? Well, I'll jump in. I think the gender piece, right. Um, And which is something that I think about because, you know, as I said, mother and daughter, both (laughs) my mother and my daughter both have ADHD. So just this idea that girls um, don't get quote unquote ADHD, um, which is not true. It just, in general, it can present differently, not always, obviously, right? But oftentimes when you see ADHD in girls, you see um, you see it affect the focus and attention more. Um, in general, again, speaking in generalities, boys tend to get identified earlier because they're the, um, the little guys who are struggling in sort of kindergarten, first grade to sit still and not poke other kids and to listen to the teacher. And so those behaviors are much more noticeable. Whereas girls, again, in general, get identified later um, as the academic um, demands grow um, and you start to see their performance sort of suffer a little bit. They tend to be more the quiet ones sitting looking out the window sort of thing, again, speaking in generalities. And it can be harder to notice when you're a teacher with a busy classroom and you don't necessarily pick up on that behavior or see it as problematic even because the person is appears to be behaving and uh, you know, isn't disruptive at all. So yeah, so we definitely see it in girls as well. Um, it can just um, be a little more insidious, uh, but nonetheless still requiring sort of support and intervention. I I would say that's pretty common to see in our office is more adolescent females um, that are getting diagnosed versus the younger kiddos. And it's just kind of those kiddos that fall through the cracks and really are quiet and sitting at their table and, and not breaking rules. And um, that, that definitely can happen. And especially like Katya was saying with um, many females. Mm-hmm. And so do you see um, a lot of the girls how do I say it's like really trying that much harder. So they're doing well on tests. They are, like you said, they're, they're quiet ones and they are not getting into trouble. So it just seems like they're a good student, but they are really struggling on the inside. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So a, um, they may be an adequate student, but they could be a better student, for example, like they might not be tapping their potential, right? And people might not realize it Um, or um, B, they're they're doing fine, but they're having to just, as you say, just works that much harder. It's that much more stressful in order to achieve that. Mm -hmm. That anxiety piece really is common as well, right? I um, 
the comorbidities, having multiple diagnoses with ADHD is again, more the rule than the exception. And it, uh, that seeing that high level of anxiety and stress, I think is, um, uh, from a, a clinical standpoint, we, I would say we commonly see that. Yes. Yeah. So what would be those symptoms that parents or teachers could look out for to catch our girls a little bit earlier and some of our boys who also fall into that category? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, <sighs> it's hard because they have so many people to look out for. And so the squeaky wheel so often needs to get the grease because that's the child that might, whose behavior may be disrupting the class and the learning. And so you can see why attention is directed there. It makes perfect sense. But so, yeah, I mean, I would keep out for the kids who are on the quieter side, seem a little more disengaged, you know, um, when you, uh, it's time to line up, they're the ones sort of still sitting at their desk because they just, you know, they were sort of out to lunch when the instruction, those sorts of things, like the kids who just seem a little less engaged, I would keep an eye out for. What about you, Yael? And, and um, as a parent, uh, it, it can be hard sometimes, especially if you have one child or um, uh, um, different aged children to see what is typical development versus what is different. But if you have any questions, if you feel like your child is spending twice as long on homework, if you feel like there are nights where the child is crying or um, nervous about things because it's so much pressure, for sure, ask for help. Let's let's find out, is there any issue here? It is always better to ask some questions and, and then be told, oh no, everything is you know totally fine. Or hey, let's put in place X, Y, and Z to help your kiddo. So I I um I think both of us are really proponents of asking and 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 finding out more. Um even if you are doubting yourself and being like, oh, I'm a worrier. I don't know about my kid. Ask. It is totally yeah. fine. Yeah. Oftentimes there'll be that. Um, it's not uncommon that we have a case where the mother, it, I mean, not nothing against fathers. Often the mother, it's the one who says ever since so-and-so was a little baby, I thought something wasn't, you know, something wasn't developing the way I thought it should. And I told the pediatrician and they said, oh, it's fine. And I told my friends and they said, what are you talking about? Little so-and-so is so well behaved, you know? And so oftentimes there was this sense over time um, and people doubted themselves though. Other times I feel like too, there's, there's that sense, but there's also a fear associated with it. Like, you know, if I, I don't want to lift up this rock and look under it because there might be something scary under there kind of mm-hmm. thing. Right. And so people will put off getting evalu- evaluations or checking in with a pediatrician or whatever for that reason as well, just because it's almost better, you know, not to know and to just keep sort of chugging on than to maybe find out something that, you know, might be scary for one reason or another. I, I wonder if that leads us to another misconception, which is about this idea of a child being lazy, mm. um, which maybe that could be the, the term that you are saying instead of, oh, what actually is going on here. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon to hear this and not just from parents, but um, even professionals could, could use terms like this. Yeah. Oh, Kachi and I talk a lot about can'ts versus won'ts. What is it that this child is unable to do because of a deficit? So uh, again, a brain-based weakness in executive skills, like um, the child cannot plan ahead or organize because this is a true area of challenge and their prefrontal cortex is developing slower and, and, and having challenges here with this versus a won't. What is it that a child can do, but doesn't want to do? So this is hard to tease apart. In many instances, it's more the can'ts than it is the won'ts. And we we miss we see, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we definitely mislabel that a lot of the time. And this idea of lazy, what does that really mean? Mm-hmm. Is lazy mm-hmm. because they're slower moving at things or transitions are hard or um, getting away from video games is difficult. Mm-hmm. That's probably not lazy. That is a true challenge for these kids. Right. I always feel like that's a red flag whenever a parent says, you know, mm-hmm. No, I shouldn't use this word, but I've always wondered if so-and-so is lazy. Mm-hmm. I always feel like ding, ding, ding. Okay. That puts you on my radar. This is definitely something we want to rule in and rule out. Right. right. Because um, it is a word that often comes up and parents typically don't want to use that word in conjunction with sure. their child because it's, you know, it has its pejorative sort of side. Right. Um, but they have sort of been unable to sort of prevent themselves from having that feeling. Right. Um, and so I 
think that's often a red flag in these ADHD evals that, mm, yeah, it looks like there could be something there, right? Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. So going back to the story of my son who likes to run away from reading, it is not because he doesn't want to read. He doesn't want to read. Mm-hmm. It is because he has challenge challenges yeah. in right. reading, right? So I even um, have, I've gotten him tutors and uh, he works with somebody at school and he gets really embarrassed. He's like a, I will say slight perfectionist. He's actually gotten a lot better. Cause he was, he, I mean, if he even wrote something wrong, he would tear up the paper. I mean, that was just how bad it was, but now it's just, he just wants to do good enough. So he's a slow reader. He gets embarrassed when he has to read in front of people, especially if they're new. And mm-hmm. so again, he may not finish his homework if I don't have a chance to do it with him. So right. he, you know, I don't say that he gets in trouble with the school. They actually have like a process in place. So it's not really getting in trouble. It's just a way for um, us as parents to be notified that they did not finish their homework to go through it with them. But the bottom line is it's because he is a slow reader and it just takes him a lot longer than his sister, for example, because he compares himself a lot to his sister, which I tell him. So not inevitable, to do. right? So exactly. unfortunate, but yeah. so inevitable. Yeah, exactly. It's like a human trait you're talking about. I mean, avoiding something that seems scary or hard, and certainly in front of other people. Um, I heard I had a supervisor once who sort of said, "Well, it's like what if you're going to plunk me down at MIT in the middle of like some aerospace engineering lecture? I'm going to be trying to get the heck out of there, right? <laughs> I'm not going to know what's going on." I mean, you know, you have to. Sometimes people they need an example to sort of personalize it, yeah. right? It's no, not just exactly um, right. quote unquote being lazy, right? Exactly. Exactly. I, so, I think that's, oh, I'm so sorry. No, um, no. I think that's another thing we listen for, right? When we're hearing from parents, are there things that are being avoided? When I hear a child doesn't like to read, I always want to look at their reading skills and understand, it, is this a true area of challenge or whatever it might be that fits under this category? They avoid X, Y, Z. And then you, you really want to look at why, is this happening? Because there is a why, and it's not the answer is not lazy. Um, yes. uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a really important point. Yeah, right. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So, anything else? Other misconceptions. Yeah. Um, I think a good one is this whole idea of so and so will just outgrow the ADHD, right? Um, And so, I mean, again, just with my personal experience, I mean, my mom's in her seventies and she has ADHD. It didn't magically disappear, but I'm sure it morphed over time. Right. I mean, typically what parents will say, oh, will little Jimmy just outgrow this? We'll sort of be like, well, I don't have my, you know, no crystal ball, but what I predict is that over time, sort of the more flagrant um, sort of self-regulation symptoms related to hyperactivity and pulse control in general, those will sort of, you know, decrease, but we, we wouldn't be surprised to see ongoing issues related to attention, organization, time management, like all those sorts of things, which many adults who we know <clears throat> and ourselves sometimes too struggle with, right? And so these are manageable things. Um, so again, it doesn't sort of need to be a scary thing, like, oh gosh, my child will have this forever. It's going to morph and change over time. And um, it's just something to be aware of. It, you know, it's just not just they're going to wake up someday and poof, that's the end of that kind of thing, right? Yeah, I there, and I I think from research, there's definitely individuals who don't meet criteria as they get older, but that doesn't mean that like these executive issues don't suddenly go away. But people manage them really well, and as they learn these skills, um, right. hey, I use my electronic calendar all the time to manage my organizational challenges. It beeps at me and lets me know what's going on, right. but that's fine. That's how a lot of us um, live and, and get by with things. And I, um, I do talk to families a lot about how, if they, they put in place nothing right now, mm-hmm. what would that look like later? Mm-hmm. Probably their child would have a, a dif- more difficult journey, but could still get to a point where things were comfortable. Yeah let's make the journey easier. Let's, let's, let's help with that and, and, and give supports and accommodations, interventions to um, assist with that. Mm-hmm. Love that. Did you want to add to that, Katya? No, I think, yeah. Okay. No, I thought I it was very well put. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
That's too funny. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's really interesting because I wasn't diagnosed until 45 and 47 now. So <laughs> the fact that people grow, you know, outgrow it is definitely yeah. not true for my case. So well, your face, when I said it, I was like, yep, there's a personal story <laughs> here. <laughs> right. And so, I mean, what is interesting, we always talk about though, would it have been different if I knew when I was younger, mm-hmm. but we didn't really talk about ADHD when I was younger, right? That just wasn't a conversation. And the conversation is happening so much more now. I mean, yes, we still have a while to go, but it's happening so much more now. I think I've learned so much more today about Mm -hmm. myself and about my past than I would have then. So I I think that makes perfect sense. Yeah. I was in school at the same time as you we're in the same age range. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there were kids who were in the college prep class, you know what I mean? There was like sort of tiered out in the different class levels, um, but there wasn't really discussion or understanding, I don't right. think of what the learning differences were or how they came about. Um, I know ADHD medication has been around for a long time, so that theoretically would have been available, but um, again, it would rely on accurate diagnosis, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it's so important. I mean, that's why we try to be so careful in our evaluations because really you don't want, um, the last thing you want is for a kid to notice the symptoms and and attribute them to something negative. You know, like I'm just not smart or, oh gosh, I guess so-and-so is right. I'm just lazy, et cetera, you know, because then that's just so damaging. We'd much rather be able to put an accurate name on it. And also that accurate name comes with, you know, empirically supported interventions. So there's a lot we can do to help. I like that. that um, this was actually what we've been talking about the past few days on um, our uh, Instagram account is just how to talk about the diagnosis with a child. And, um, and, and helping them get rid of some of these misconceptions, yeah. I think is uh, extremely valuable for a child and, and empowering for an individual. And perhaps you can talk uh, uh, your journey through that, but it, it just gives you like, yeah, that's why this is hard that, you know, this is real. This is a, a real brain-based issue. And um, again, replacing those negative words. This is not oppositionality. This is not defiance. This is real. Uh, This is hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, during the journey, especially with my children, I have replaced a lot of my vocabulary because I've learned so much. And, you know, there's just certain words we just do not use in our household. Laziness is one of them. I mean, I can literally see them paralyzed when they have so much on their plate. I mean, I can literally see their minds spinning, right? And how we have to work to break those things down. But the bottom line is, if I hadn't learned all of that, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be where I am today to really understand where they are today. It's sort of like what Yael was saying earlier about the, what the can't versus the won't. There's the, the perspective from the adult is also the should, like, oh, my kid should be able to do this. Well, my kid is in third grade. They should be able to do X, Y, Z. And first of all, that should, I don't know where the heck it's based on some personal, I, I don't know what, what the, sh- where does this come from? A and B, regardless of where it comes from, it's irrelevant because every kid's an individual and we can't, you know, we know that you can't sort of say that this is definitely expected at this age. Um, and so that's a real mindset sort of changer too. I think that's important. Um, and especially too, when, you know, when you see like you have two kids in your house and you see a younger sibling doing something better than an older sibling. And you're like, well, if the younger one can do it, the older one should be able to, but they can't for one reason or another. Right. And so it's just, um, you have to sort of shift how you think about things. I think consciously in those areas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I even tell my children, I said, if you guys just knew how well you complement each other, right. So you know, my son has strength that my daughter is a little bit, I don't want to say weaker in, but she is just like, okay. So like for me, I've realized mm-hmm. that there's just certain things I am not good at <laughs> and I am okay with that. I, yeah, and I get fun. help with those things, right? They right. really complement each other in certain areas. And I said, I'm like, if you guys would just get together, <laughs> you would be a powerhouse. Out, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're too busy like this, right? Brother and sister. But yeah, yeah, so it's it, it is amazing to look at it differently. If you don't look at it as like true weaknesses, it's just some things you're good at and some things that you just don't, you're just not right. And mm-hmm. like for me, my struggle is writing. I can tell a story all day. I can write a story, 
the editing is like my most horrible thing. So I have to, if I send out an imp- important email, I have somebody else who is good at it, look it over, right? That is okay. And those are the yeah, type totally. of things I'm trying to teach my kids. What yeah, those are great. With her. Yeah, I think that's so smart. I mean, you know, you identify the areas where you do need that extra help and then there's no shame in asking for it and figuring out strategies to use, right? We all have our strengths and our weaknesses, just part mm-hmm. of being a human being. And I think um, people, it's, it can be hard to remember that sometimes. It is, it is. But exactly what we want kids to hear about, like your brain is amazing. Here are the things that come naturally to you and are really wonderful. And here are things we want to work on. And that that's true for all of us. And how cool to figure out how to accommodate yourself. And that will, I mean, that's exactly what you did. And that's exactly what we do. If that's uh, my organizational skills are not my area of strength. I have figured out all the ways to work around that. And that's fine. It, it's, it's perfect. And you're modeling that for your kids, right? Yeah, I mean, you're yeah. seeing. So mom noticed she's not great at X, Y, Z. And she's like, okay with it. It's not the end of the world. And she figured out a strategy and she's using that. And now she's accomplishing X, Y, Z. I think it's a great um, yeah. thing for them to see. Totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, is there anything else you want to mention before we really talk about how parents can get the, you know, facts as much as possible so they can really support their children. Any other misconceptions that you guys want to mention? I, I think, um, there was two others that we kind of mentioned, um, on our account. And one was about that, um, uh, misconceptions surrounding medication, Mm -hmm. uh, stimulant medication use and that, uh, parents sometimes will ask, well, if children take stimulants, does that make them higher risk for using other drugs, um, illicit uh, drugs and uh, different, uh, prescription meds. Um, and actually the research has shown that if you do not treat ADHD, those individuals are at higher risk. Mm -hmm. Um, of uh, drug use than the population of individuals who are taking. And the other sorts of impulsive behaviors we don't want to see our kids getting into when it comes to driving, you know, romantic relationships, et cetera. Um, And then the final one I think we uh, wrote about was just that sometimes parents blame themselves um, for ADHD diagnoses. Um, sure, there is a genetic component. So yes, this there is a piece there that comes from you, but it is not a result of parenting. And I think that that is just a guilt that many parents come into our office with is I did this, I did something wrong. And, um, and, and I have to say, that's not just for ADHD. I would for any, um, any question that comes into our doors. It is something as parents that we just hold. Um, and, gosh, it is not a parenting piece. Um, There are awesome ways to structure the home and we can talk through ideas of how to help, but it is not because of your parenting skills. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I think those were our big ones. Katya, did you want to add anything else there? No, I think that covers it. Love that. So how can parents get the facts? What information or resources are out there that they, if they want to find out more or how to approach it differently, approach their children's situation differently, where can they look? It's a good question because so much information to our fingertips these days, but not all of it reliable, right? Um, so easy to go down a rabbit hole yeah. um, and in a, in a not necessarily productive direction, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I would... I mean, of course, I'm obliged to recommend our own Instagram account. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm obliged to recommend that. <laughs> and there, I mean, there are great websites. Uh, I mean, I would look up the ones that, in general, I would look up the ones that are, are um, run by well-known national organizations like um, CHAD. What does that stand for? You know, Children and Adults with ADHD, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the AD. The Attitude Magazine. I mean, there are various ones in the Mayo Clinic, like the ones that are we know are, are, are sort of um, legitimate, right? Um, and then there are also um, great YouTube channels, great books, other great Instagram accounts. I mean, there's just, there's a lot out there and you sort of have to, um, you just have to parse through it with a fine tooth comb, right? Um, and great also 
resources for kids. Um, we, um, you know, like workbooks, um, books that parents can read with kids about um, various sorts of symptoms associated with ADHD, like maintaining personal space and sort of thinking before you speak and that sort of thing. And another thing we're obliged to mention is that we've written a book in this regard, which <laughs> we're in the process of trying to get published. So about how to- Congratulations. Um, well, thanks. Hold on to that until well, um, we're out of the I'm putting it much. out there for you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. That's kind of you. Um, it's a children's book. It's for either kids to read on their own or for parents to read with their kids, introducing diagnosis and sort of what it means and that sort of thing. Do you want what do you want to add, Yael? Yeah, and, and we can um write out a few of our most commonly um uh used resources, uh, but we really like I think you've had um, some professionals on this podcast before, but we we love books that are written from a research and evidence based perspective. Russell Barkley is a huge researcher in ADHD and has had a few books out there that are really great. But um, happy to provide um, great. Uh, yeah. our most common ones. But there there's a lot of great things out there. It's just um, uh, a, a very difficult. Uh, pool to wait. There's a lot of, of misinformation. Is. So one of our goals, why we created a social media account was to try to create more evidence-based information. Mm, love that. I love that. And if they do have any questions for you, can you share what your IG account and any other way to get a hold of you? Yeah, um, sure. So our Instagram account is called neuropsych mom docs. Um, so a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, we're, we're new to the world of uh, social so media. But, uh, it was really hard to try to think of something that wasn't going <laughs> to be too word. But, oh, well. We were trying to cover neuropsych. Yes. Folks, right. And that we're moms. Because I think, not that you can't know about it if you're not a mom, but I think it brings a perspective, right? right. So we were trying to cover all those bases. <laughs> and we sure did. And Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, people can definitely follow us um, and write to us directly through there. Um, we are at a private practice practice in Maryland called the Stixrud Group, S-T-I-X-R-U-D. And so if people are interested in getting consultation or follow-up um, assessments or an assessment itself, um, uh, we could talk through uh, our practice, but we are happy to answer individual messages over Instagram as well. And for your uh, assessments, is that for the area of Maryland or are you also able to reach other states? Great question. So um, Kachi and I can do the DMV area. So that's um, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, if you are from out of town, um, many people, actually Kachi, are you part of SIPAC? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are some um, uh, clinicians like Katya, who um, are part of a program that can do some uh, virtual testing okay. uh, across like 20 states. Yeah, and there are a number of states that are, are partners in it. Okay. Um, and so that would be virtual. I mean, we love to see kids in person if we can, but obviously. Yeah, yeah and we can, you know, if, if it's helpful, we can always help search out some referrals in your area. Uh, awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yay. That was so good. I love that. That was really Thanks. good information. Yeah. Well, it's our first podcast, so you know. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm honored. Thank you for having us. <laughs> that is too funny. Yeah, no, that was really good. I mean, thank you. To your point, you talking about literally wading through a lot of information. There is so much information, and you do. You really have to. How do you? You really have to be conscious of finding the right information because you can go down a rabbit hole. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, people will, and if you put out the wrong information, people will hold you accountable. <laughs> so you yes. have to, I mean, for your own self, but also if you're going to repeat the information on a place like social media, you really want to make sure you're doing as much totally. as the right. Yeah. And you so, can imagine a child uh, uh, looking up things too, and going exactly. down that rabbit hole. It's exactly. so hard. Yeah. What a, what a wild time to live in where everything is available and you, you have to really research your research. It's just, it's mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah, it is yeah. a lot. It is a lot. So to your point, 
um, just like with my daughter who loves to read. So I started off her off with a um, ADHD book and, you know, mm -hmm. she's almost done with it, but I'm trying to make sure she's reading certain things. Right. Mm -hmm. So then that yeah. way she doesn't seem number one, overwhelmed with the information, especially because it's about her. Yeah. Um, but also because I don't want her to read the wrong things and feel bad about herself sure. either. Of course. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You really have to screen that so carefully, don't yeah. you? You really do. Yeah. You really do. I mean, yeah. Any, any book has really got to have, um, an emphasis on the strengths as well as the concerns. Oh yeah. So, yeah. There are a lot of, um, books out there that focus, we did a lot of research, you know, when we were starting to write our own children's book, and there are a lot of books out there that focus on certain symptoms or characteristics associated with a particular, like ADHD, learning disorder, whatever it is, um, like books about, like I was saying, personal space, impulse control, that sort of thing. Uh, there aren't as many that present a diagnosis, like here's the name, here's what it means, here are some sorts of ways it can look um, here are some things that can be done to help that sort of thing. There is a little bit less of that directed at, um, you know, so your elementary school age population. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, hopefully that's a gap we can help to start fill. Oh, very cool. I'm excited for you too. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you again for coming on. This was good. Thank oh, this was again. awesome. Thank you for having us. That uh, really, it was great. Uh, this is, you know, one of our passions is trying to educate and inform and, um, and be a part of this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank well, you. Cool. Thank you. All right, everyone that closes up another episode of ADHD love parent talk. If you want more content like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell because every time a video comes out, you will be notified. And if you liked this video, make sure you hit that like button. All right, everyone have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.